Welcome to Tina Fey Mysteries, the show where we attempt to answer the leftover questions from Tina Fey's acting career. Why did she agree to be in Muppets Most Wanted? No, just kidding, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> I tricked you and you fell for it. TFA head writer Marty Eisenberg and I will once again answer fan-submitted questions and uncover genuinely new information, including cancelled characters and storylines from the non-renewed Season 4. We'll learn about TFA Agent Simmons. We'll learn if Marty knows the Cardi B WAP dance. And a trio of seemingly unrelated questions will lead to the biggest revelation we've had in a long time about what some major characters might have been up to in a fourth season. Let's jump in. First, we have to talk about a left-field discovery. The fact that Agent Simmons, from the Michael Bay films, might have been in the fourth season of Transformers Animated. Recently, the YouTube channel Infinite Frontiers uploaded a video of Derek J. Wyatt's panel at Auto Assembly 2010, Derek J. Wyatt being the art director of Transformers Animated. In this footage, Derek J. Wyatt says something that took me by surprise. Um, we had actually we had the plans for, for new human characters in, in season four. We were going to do a uh, 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 Sector 7 type agency with uh, uh, and would have a specific agent who was a relative of some cameo characters we had in the show. I took to Twitter to interrogate Mr. Wyatt and he revealed that a TFA version of Agent Simmons, or at least a character based on him, was indeed considered for the fourth season. And although they didn't have any specific storylines in mind, Derek had begun designing the character. Around the same time he designed Czar, by the looks of it. I colored the model for fun, and I made some fan art of the character that I might as well show you, even though it's not official. Huge thank you to Infinite Frontiers for uploading this. Agent Simmons, of all characters, may have been in the fourth season of Transformers Animated. One man! Alone! Stop saying that! Betrayed by the country Oh my goodness, I'm in the car, okay? You're not alone! Derek Rodriguez asks how many seasons would have preceded season four, and had Transformers Animated continued. Lazy Sad Potato Comics and... I can't read this name, asked similar questions. I'll let my good friend Alex Cabrera ask Marty on this one. So so which character had the most planned for them like beyond season four? If if you had a concept we, of that. We barely got through a plan for season four, so uh, we didn't really have any plans for anybody beyond that. How was Transformers Animated originally supposed to end? You probably can answer this, but... Like, you know, what is the ideal it, ending? It wasn't movie? supposed to end. It was supposed to go on forever. Wow. <laughs> yeah, there was there was no official ending because we never knew where when and where the official end would be. We didn't know didn't know a hundred percent that we would get a pickup beyond season two. Um, we didn't know that we were whether we'd get a pickup beyond season three. We we assumed in both cases that we would, and in one case we were correct, in one case we weren't. Um, but you know the the plan, at least on my end, was to just keep doing it until they told me not to. All right. Wow. Soundwave Gaming wants to know why the Japanese intro was so vastly different and misleading. <laughs> yeah. Marty and head toy designer Eric Siebenhaler are wondering as well. When uh, Animated was being brought to Japan, I'm not sure if uh, you guys approve of like the original Japanese opening for it. No, we, no, we they had, didn't. It was a surprise to us. Oh, they did. A pleasant surprise. Oh, but, that's, yeah, that's interesting. That, that was above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> the Japanese production studio kind of just made it. Uh, no one in the U.S. is really sure why. No one knows who this giant ghostly figure is. I highly doubt that the Japanese studio that made it even knows who this is. They just made a thing that looked cool. Uh, we weren't supposed to think about it. Some hell of a fanboy asks how the downtown Blackout episode would have worked given Blackout status as a minor character. Well, I hate to break it to you, some hell of a fanboy, but the Downtown Blackout episode is a fanfiction and it originates from the Ideas Wiki. This this was never going to be an episode because, as you said, Blackout is just an extra. 
Frighten Prime asks why all of the Autobots didn't have blasters. Well, there are both story reasons and development reasons for this one. During the creation of Transformers Animated, the executive producer Sam Register, who is now the president of Warner Bros. Animation and Cartoon Network Studios, pushed very hard for the show to stray away from warring robots and lean into heroes fighting crime after the success of Teen Titans and Ben 10. Yeah, and that was that was really more a reflection of, of, of season one, where it was really kind of more of a, a superhero in the city mm -hmm. show, as opposed to a pure Transformers at least in the first half of the season. Because so in your it, production it level, you pitched Teen Titans meets Transformers, basically. Uh, which, I mean, that really came not from me. That was Sam. more from Sam because yeah. he had just done Teen Titans and had a lot of success with it. So um, mo most of the things that are nods to Teen, teen Titans came from Sam. All right. Um, and Matt I and Derek had worked on on Teen Titans as well. This naturally led to a decreased focus on guns and weapons, and led to more creative problem solving using tools. On top of this, giving the Autobots objectively worse combat technology helped cement their status as underdogs. If every Autobot was dual wielding fusion cannons, they wouldn't be as outmatched. In addition, the fights wouldn't be as interesting. Combat in TFA is constantly varied because the Autobots employ jump jets, magnets, wrecking balls, electrical blasts, shurikens, axes, grapplers, bolos, nets, only used once by the way. The powers bounce off each other and interact in super fun ways, and it's far more visually and narratively interesting than if everyone just had an identical blaster gun arm. Internally, according to the TFA lore provided in the Allspark Almanac, the Autobots gradually de-armed and de-armed in the aftermath of the Great War. They kinda didn't like that war. It scarred their society and they wanted to get away from that warrior culture, be as dissimilar to the Decepticons as possible. This led to the Autobot society appearing as it is but is also the reason they're so vulnerable and ill-equipped to halt Decepticon advances, growing in size and power in the far outer reaches of the galaxy. So TLDR, the whole storyline with the demilitarized resistance and the growing First Order from The Force Awakens was explicitly stolen from Transformers Animated. Also the ending of The Avengers. My friend Gwen wants to know if Marty Eisenberg knows the WAP dance. I have no idea what the WAP dance is. <laughs> okay. My kids might, but I don't know. I was dared to ask. We can move on. Congratulations. I was telling him not to do this. <laughs> SG slash Goji fan and Household Wheel ask what the current Starscream clones would have been doing and if there were plans for more. We have answers to both of those questions. First off, it is known that there were no plans for new clones to be introduced. Well, we haven't seen any other Starscream clones like Dirge in Season 4, how it went into production. I, th I think we reached our limit on Starscream clones. I know we had, Eric and I had talked about the last two, just so they could make toys of them. And, and oh, remember we, we had talked about, it was, it was Gluttony and it was... Uh, oh, right, right, we wanted a few. Envy. Envy, envy. yeah. Oh, okay. so, so but did, I don't know if we had a few more personality. We had this. Yeah, I don't know if they would have ever made it into the show because that. Yeah, that arc was kind of done. Yeah, I don't think we came up with any. We, there weren't any plans for season four stories around the clones. Ramjet and Sunstorm are in the trial of Megatron outline, so we know they'd have come back. But what about Skywarp and Thundercracker? They were shot into space and transwarped, and we never seen. We never saw them again. Um. Yeah, we probably would have brought them back. I mean, I, I never really thought of them. And any of the clones by those names. I mean, we never That's put true, those names yeah. in the script. It was always, you know, Ego Starscream, Coward Starscream, uh, Liar Starscream. You know, it was it was just the different aspects of his personality. So we, those those names were added on subsequently and it sort of become canon, but. Uh, in my mind, they were all just Starscream. Yeah, that's what I thought. We actually talked about that. And, and also, from from a uh, production standpoint, we couldn't call them by different names because then 
that would mean Tom Kenny was voicing six more characters and we yes. would have to pay them. You, so you had to name them Starscream so you couldn't pay them more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I never saw the point of giving them different names anyway. I know that that was how it was done in G1, but... Yeah. It's, it's like fan service. I think Derek yeah. probably, he colored them after specific characters. Yeah, and I, I guess for convenience sake, um, they, he continued to refer to them by, by those names, but they, but they were they, always, you know, star They definitely would have gone me. by those names in the actual show because they were just clones. Right, right. I thought so. Yeah, unless our budget suddenly increased. Yeah. And that just leaves Slipstream. We'll get back to her. In the meantime, remember to like and subscribe, engage in any way you can, because the YouTube algorithm does not trust me after I uploaded 24 videos on April Fool's Day. Chomp Chom asks why Optimus Prime is so sexy. It's pretty self-explanatory, there's not much I can say about it, just look at him. You know what would make him sexier? Remember Protoform Yogatron? What do you think Optimus Prime would look- OH MY GOD! Oh Jesus! Ah! AJ Tolan asks about the unreleased TFA shorts, Starscream's fantasy, and logo. Oh, this kills me. Back in 2008, a series of Transformers animated shorts were released on the Battle Begins DVD set. Animated by Studio 4C, these roughly two-minute clips featured the characters in some pretty comical animations. How come those people are banging their hands together? It's weird. It's called clapping. It's just what you do at the end of a performance. Oh, okay. But two shorts weren't included on this DVD. Logo and Starscream's Fantasy. In Logo, Blitzwing flips the Decepticon insignia back and forth in front of the screen before Lugnut slaps him out of it. In Starscream's Fantasy, Starscream has a vision of himself being appointed the Decepticon leader before Megatron wakes him up. These are, by all accounts, fully animated and have been shown at BotCon 2009 and BotCon 2012. I've found several blog posts from the time that reference them. Fully animated, Transformers animated content exists deep in Hasbro's vaults, and probably under a thousand people have seen it. <laughs> I've looked for these before. I've gone deep into the O's at the bottom of Google, trying to find a bootleg recording or something, but I've, I've found nothing. If you have any information about these, please contact me, because I want to see these, as do most fans. Max Mock asks why Metroplex only appears as a building, or if there were any plans for him to transform into robot mode eventually. This post from March 14th, 2009 is absolutely positive the Metroplex will transform to robot mode by the end of Season 3. But is there any truth to this? Can Metroplex or form, uh, Fortress Maximus transform? Fortress Maximus has a combat mode. <laughs> yeah, it can transform in that sense. I think they can transform, the buildings can transform into other functions, but we didn't have them, we didn't have any plans to transform them. Into, into robot, robot mode? Robots. No robot mode? No, we, we weren't going to do an Omega Supreme. Oh, yeah. You can do that once in a series, I think you can do it again, you're, you're repeating yourself. <laughs> Dinobot Kuryu, a true OG of this channel, as well as Shizik Lizik, asked questions about the pre-war era and what made Megatron start the Great War. The details regarding the pre-war era are very fuzzy and almost exclusively found in the Allspark Almanac. Basically, there were two factions of Cybertronians, the Protectobots and the Destrons, and then they evolved to be Autobots and Decepticons. Megatron overthrew the previous Decepticon leader, Megazaric, in combat, exiled him, took control of the cons himself. As tensions began to grow between the factions, and Megatron's speeches stirred up controversy and Decepticon support, Ultra Magnus filed the Decepticon Registration Act, which backfired and led to the Great War as we know it. The war was waged for millions of years, Autobot space bridges gave them the tactical advantage, like Union Railroads during the American Civil War, 
Lockdown stole the protoforms from the temple, Project Omega was launched, Lockdown wiped the recognition codes, Ratchet became Omega's host, apparently there was like 30 Omega Sentinels, meaning that Omega really wasn't special at all, Omega sacrifices himself to defeat the Decepticons in the Battle of Iacon, and the Decepticons are exiled via the Tyrest Accords, where Megatron goes to search for the Elspark aboard the Nemesis with the dumbest possible crewmates. Now, here's the thing. When Jim Sorensen and Bill Forrester sat down to write the Almanac, they weren't trying to flesh out Megatron's rise to power, they were simply trying to cram in as many references for diehard fans to geek out over as they could. Protectobots, Destrons, Megazaric, Decepticon Registration Act, Tyrest Accords, all of these were just to make fans say, I know what that is, rather than a serious attempt at writing fiction. Jim and Bill are fans, like us. They're huge names in the Transformers Collectors Club, and they were just given an incredible opportunity to write this resource book about a show they love. And even though this was published by IDW and it's incredibly fun, it really is looked at by Derek as fanfiction. A lot of the writing in the Almanac is directly contradictory to what Derek and Marty had envisioned for the characters in the series. Even though this is a fun little article, it shouldn't be taken that seriously as Megatron's origin. It's just a string of references strung together rather than any serious attempt to contextualize him or his motivations. And that's why canon, canon is overhyped. It's overprioritized. Scourge Dreammaker wants me to talk about Transformers Heroes. Okay, sure. Before Marty Eisenberg and Derek J. Wyatt were brought on board, Transformers Animated went under the production name of Transformers Heroes. This was the earliest iteration of Sam Register calling for a superhero-themed Transformer show. Eric Siebenhaler was fully on board at this point of the process, and a pair of combining jet twins were among the first things he envisioned. Marty Eisenberg was brought on as a story editor following his work on Transformers Beast Machines. There, he created the production bible, and Derek J. Wyatt was brought on board soon after. Eventually, Hasbro decided to rename the series Transformers Animated to distinguish it from the live-action films. In the early episodes of Transformers Animated, you can definitely see the skeleton of a show that used to be called Transformers Heroes, because the question, what does it mean to be a hero, hangs over Optimus throughout the entire first season, before gradually losing relevance. In my opinion, the show should have kept this name, because Transformers animated? That doesn't narrow it down. I don't recall any non-animated Transformers shows. In middle school, I convinced my friend to watch Transformers animated. So she went home. She was like, eh, I'm on episode six. I'm not really like it. I was like, oh, what's wrong with Blast from the Past? She was like, oh no, this episode's called Masters and Students. She watched the wrong show because of the generic title. And we've reached this three seemingly unrelated questions that wound up going hand in hand to give us a substantial look at what some of our favorite Decepticons might have been doing in a season four. In the trial of Megatron outline from TF Nation 2019, Megatron desperately throws Lugnut, Blitzwing, and Shockwave into Trypticon's reactor. Fabulous Katska asks what their ultimate fate was. Do they, was the idea that like they'd sacrificed their lives or would they have been fine? Would they have come back? Um, I think the plan was to bring them back somehow um, because I think the idea was that they were going to be um, a, a, a sort of a, a, a splinter faction that was going after Megatron because they weren't too happy about how he treated them. Um, so I think the plan was to, to have Starscream recruit them. Oh, separate. interesting. That was a question we had as well, as how Starscream might have plugged into Season 4. In Endgame Part 2, a deleted scene depicts Slipstream resurrecting Starscream by planting an Allspark fragment back in his spark chamber. I've animated this scene, and you should check it out. Christian Bouchard and Harris Wyatt 22 ask if this deleted scene would have been incorporated into the following season, and what role Starscream would have had to play. Um, yeah, I think the, the intention was to set it up for season four, and maybe the decision to cut it was based on the fact that there wasn't going to be a season four, so they wanted, wanted the end, you know, that end game to feel more final. 
they were um, boarding and assembling that episode. I think we, we had gotten the word. Oh, I, I just want to ask, would you have moved it to season four? Had you gotten one? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, yeah, I think it's necessary. Okay. To... Interesting. Wow. Mm -hmm. In issue 71 of the Transformers Collectors Club, a collaboration with Derek Wyatt, the description of Megatron Must Be Destroyed mentions that Slipstream has a team of Decepticons. However, at TF Nation 2019, someone asked Marty this question, and he simply didn't remember Slipstream having a team of Decepticons. Harris Wyatt 22 asks about this team, and by now, the pieces are all coming together. And I'm gonna guess it's Lugnut, Blitzwing, Shockwave to kind of take down Megatron with Starscream? Yeah, but I think um, it, it wasn't female Starscream who was in charge. Or uh, I, I looked at my description for it and it, it said Starscream. Oh, interesting. Because this is from Derek and it says uh, female Starscreams, Decepticons. Like, I believe Derek wrote these descriptions. Again, it's been like 15 years, the idea is- Yeah, and, and maybe that was his, he had it in mind that maybe she was more the power behind the throne and she, she was calling the shots. Uh, I don't know, we hadn't, um, we hadn't developed it. Okay. The details of it. So, I mean, if that's what Derek wanted, that's probably what would have happened. So. Thank you for tuning in to TFA Mysteries. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I would like to thank my Patreon supporters. Follow me on social media, like and subscribe, etc. Marty will be back next time as we discuss the specific timeline of the fourth season's development and lack of renewal, and we'll learn just how much of the fourth season was specifically planned out. Really quickly, I, I guess this flash forward episode may have been cut. Was there a, a title for it at any point? Um, I believe the title was... I'll see you then.